Okay, here we go. Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here. I reviewed the Santa Claus 2, the sequel to the first successful hit that started Tim Allen's uh, movie career after his um, hilarious uh, sitcom Home Improvement where he played Tim the Toeman Taylor. Yes. And of course he always does the stand-up uh, comedies. Even though, yes, he did got into trouble in the past, but that's all there. I mean, he does come up with his own jokes, you know, like sexist jokes or you know, jokes about cars, you know, jokes about other stuff too that you can get to. Some people might not get it, but other times you would. I mean, I mean, Tim Allen, I I always love too. I mean, with all the wisecracking jokes he does, it's just hilarious. Anyway, <laughs> now I thought the sequel was actually um, surprisingly good and great and more infecting. It has a lot of heart warmth into it. I mean, you got Elizabeth Mitchell as a welcome presence as Carol Newman, the principal at a, a local high school it's somewhere which the movie was actually shot in Canada, by the way. Uh, keep that in mind, just like the first film was. Um, the fact that uh, Charlie had now became a troubled juvenile teenager, yeah, which wasn't a great idea to actually have him going involved with you know, throwing all, all this graffiti around for the halls at school, thinking that you know Carol's a non-believer, so that's why you know she pretty much hates Christmas in a way. And the fact that Charlie stuck with this secret all this time because he wanted to tell everyone that Santa is real and that his father is Santa, that's the problem. I mean, even even the, um, Scott himself uh, felt like, you know, that Carol couldn't believe what he said, though. And having to get stuck with that. And so, of course, because Carol had to be so cynical at times and, and everything. But... Deep down of it, she's actually a very wonderful and very caring woman. Just stuck in, in her hard times when she was a child. Yeah. Her parents, you know, were getting into bigger fights and and all. Of course, we now get to learn that uh, later. Anyway, it was great, in my opinion but not as excellent as the first one. However, th because uh, there were some issues with the film, I mean, Toy Santa was a pretty lame villain, uh, also portrayed by Tim Allen. I mean, he was this doppelganger. They had to create him uh, through the machine that duplicates, so that way, you know, in case if he takes over, so in case if uh, Scott Calvin leaves, since he's already becoming his normal self and he has his uh, watch to, you know, just to, to prepare and hoping that he'll be able to rush in time to find a Mrs. Claus I mean this is where he'll finally get back to becoming Santa Claus again you know he gets his power again and all and of course he chose uh, Carol um, and Toy Santa was created by Curtis the Elf who happened to be the assistant of uh, Bernard the Head Elf played by David Crumholtz, and Curtis is played by Spencer Breslin. Now, he was okay, but at times he's very annoying. I mean, he kind of gets on my nerves a bit. I mean, I I mean, I don't hate the actor. It's understandable because he does have a lisp, you know, just like Michael Ray Bauer has. You know, the guy who played Donkey Lips in Salute Your Shorts. And so it's understandable. But the fact that he keeps, like, talking real fast and he starts to act like this it just bothers me um, Toy Santa may have its moments too where I, I forgot to mention that there was some Toy Story references like the scene where you know they were in a battle and this is where he actually says the line you are a sad strange little man and I was hoping I was gonna say and you have my pity <laughs> and also there was even a scene where he was drinking the entire cup of hot cocoa and, and then he's just going around saying my that is nice hot cocoa give me some more 
I'm feeling very buzz. That sort of thing. <laughs> anyway. But it, it, it kind of uh, brought the film a little down a bit, too. It's like, you know, he's he goes around, you know, dresses up like he's the leader of of a uh, a dictator and, and he's just going around sending all the naughty kids you know lump of colds even though all the kids weren't that naughty and and the fact that he sends all these toy soldiers to take over I mean that's just come on I know I mean they have to go there all right <laughs> and anyway now I did saw the sequel in feeders so I forgot to mention that and I did enjoy seeing it at, at the time, and and I did saw that with the first film, too. And, um, of course, I did show you the Blu-ray, you know, since I bought the free movie collection. The transfers on the sequels are, are actually uh, incredibly solid and, and stunning. The, f the first movie, on the other hand, while it was being shot in 35mm, it has some black levels here and there, but it still looks uh, solid in a way. I mean, it's probably the best this movie will ever look. Because uh, the sequels themselves were shot digitally. So you could tell how different they look. And it was given like a bit of a, a pasty, um, fluffy, and kiddish tone. I mean, given its G rating compared to the, the first movie. Yeah, plus... Um, the, there was no foul language either um, in the sequels. That's what I noticed too. I mean, the first one did have some foul language. Maybe a few. Like, I do hear hell and I think I might hear some damn or so. Yeah. Or other uh, wisecracking jokes, you know, like butt naked and. <laughs> and I mean, they once had a line called 1 800 spank me, but that's been cut. And all these other scenes here. Okay, <laughs> but now I'm going to get to the third and final movie of the Santa Claus trilogy, which was considered to be the worst of the franchise. I mean, despite the fact that we had the same director who did the second movie, you know, Michael Lembeck, and they had two writers this time. I mean, instead of having five, um, it's the same writers who did the second movie. And that is The Santa Claus Free, The Escape Clause. Uh, this time around, it's um, Tim Allen reprises role once again as Scott Calvin, a.k.a. Santa Claus, uh, with Elizabeth Mitchell reprising her role as Carol Newman, a.k.a. Mrs. Claus, this time, however, he's in a battle between the evil, conniving, scene-stealing uh, Jack Frost, who's now played by um, who's played by Martin Shorts, and this is the first movie in um, in nine years where both Tim Allen and Martin Short had teamed up together since yeah they collaborated since uh, Jungle the Jungle, which was directed by John Pasquin, the same director who did the first Santa Claus. He also uh, brought in his wife, uh, Jo Beb Williams, uh, from Poltergeist, along with the sequel. So it's interesting to see that um, he got his wife to be in this, you know, playing the, his, uh, his ex-wife and all. Learn that he actually had a son in law. <laughs> okay. So that's pretty interesting. But most of the actors um, in this sequel, they reprise their roles too. All except for David Crumholtz. And yes, this is the only sequel where David Crumholtz did not come back to play Bernard, the head elf of the entire um, North Pole. Because now. Curtis the Elf, who was played by Spencer Breslin, had took over. This was a bad idea. It really was. And this is how the story is going to turn out to be, because 
by by comparison with the first two movies, this one was incredibly weak. And it started to become a little mean spirited too. And it was running out of steam. Uh, however, though, it did actually had uh, some new actors to join. At this rate, uh, Alan Arkin and Anne Margaret uh, portrays as Carol's parents. And I think that was a pretty nice idea that they got them because they're terrific actors. Uh, you also got a cameo appearance by Abigail Breslin, who happens to be Spencer's uh, younger sister. And I know this was at the time when both Alan Arkin and Abigail Breslin were both in the movie Little Miss Sunshine. I, I think Alan Arkin might have won the Oscar for that performance he had. I mean, he was nominated. It's funny, too, because now both of these films are owned by Disney. <laughs> yes, um, Little Miss Sunshine was released by Fox. I think it was Fox Searchlight that released it. And what do you know? <laughs> it's part of it. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Um, and anyway. Now, this was a pretty bad year for Tim Allen. Especially when he teams up with Spencer Breslin. He was in all three films. One was the Shaggy Dog remake that came out um, quite early in March of 2006. And it was directed by Brian Robbins, uh, the same director who gave us Good Burger, my favorite film that he, he's ever done, along with Varsity Blues, uh, The Perfect Score, uh, among several others, but of course, this would be before he went on to direct his disaster called Norbits, where he teams up with Eddie Murphy, collaborate together. And it's sad because I almost wish, you know, both of them had collaborated together to make a funny and excellent comedy. But nope, they end up making three lousy ones, with Norbit being the, the most horrible one. Yeah, and that's sad. And then, Tim Allen was in one another film, although it was pretty similar to uh, Sky High. It was called Zoom, or Zoom Academy uh, for Superheroes. And this is where uh, Tim Allen actually plays a former superhero who's on the quest to find his uh, brother, who eventually became a villain. I mean, he teams up with Courtney Cox and Chevy Chase, who, who finally made a comeback after a couple years. You know, he hasn't been in movies for a long time. So it was great to see him again, but... And he's joined in with Spencer Breslin and all the rest of the cast. I mean, you even got Kevin Zeggers uh, from Air Bud to be in this. He even got Adam Wicken to write the screenplay to join with uh, the first writer, who actually wrote the, the book. But the film was a disaster. It was tough to watch. It was embarrassing to watch, and I couldn't believe it. I actually regret myself having to see that movie in theaters, um, along with The Shaggy Dog. This is the only sequel I did not see in theaters at all. I didn't actually see the movie until I think around 2007 or 8. Um, because I was afraid that this one was going to be much worse. On, on the other hand though, by comparison, I think I'd rather watch The Santa Claus Free over The Shaggy Dog and and Zoom. Though, the Shaggy Dog did have its moments here and there, but it was just pretty bad. I mean, you also got Robert Downey Jr. playing the villain in this movie, too. And, uh, among other actors. Okay. I just felt like, you know, it's just sad that, you know, all, all this time, you know, it's, it's great to see Tim Allen doing something you know, with his entire career, but it's just seemed like it's taken a turn for the worse when he's appearing in really bad comedies. And people just, and I, and one thing I don't understand is that people hated uh, 
Christmas with the Cranks that he did, which is a better Christmas comedy that I'm going to talk about later on. Yeah, I was thinking about reviewing that too, because I'm going to watch that. And that's a way better film. I'm sorry, but I'd rather watch that than any of his worst comedies. I'll give it to you, I would rather watch that than Surviving Christmas with Ben Affleck. And James uh, Galafani, which, yeah, God was a soul, you know, from The Sopranos, among others. And uh, Christine Applegate, which I always loved her ever since um, Married with Children, <laughs> when she played Kelly Bunny, all that. So, yeah. Now, just to note that this was also the last film that Peter Borle was in. Yeah, because he passed away a month later uh, due to cancer. Uh, his last film was actually All Roads Lead Home, which came out in 2008. Yeah, it was two years uh, after his death. I guess they had to release it you know, trying to find a perfect one. So just so you know. But it is a big mistake not having David Krumholtz uh, reprising his role again. I guess mostly it's because he was doing the TV show Numbers uh, that was on CBS where he teams up with uh, Judd Hirsch from Taxi and Dear John along with Independence Day. So it, it was a crime series, yeah, a crime uh, drama series on CBS. I think it's also because he had to do other stuff too, and and I don't think it wasn't because of the fact that he could, didn't get along with uh, Spencer Breslin. I think that was just part of the featurettes uh, on the second movie. And the whole idea of him was actually not only trying to find a Mrs. Claus, so that way he'll get his powers back as Santa Claus, but also to help out Charlie since he was becoming a juvenile teenager. Yeah, which... I didn't like the idea that he was going to become a trouble one. It just seems so cliche and out of place. And we also learned that he actually has a sister named Lucy. And of course, still living with um, his mother, who happens to be Scott's ex-wife, you know, Laura. Joining in with his second father, uh, Neil. No matter what, I mean, they are a terrific family, but they are having trouble with their secrets. That was the idea, and for all, especially throughout Charlie's childhood days. Okay, and I know, I'm taking so long. But uh, let's get right to this movie. It stars Tim Allen, Martin Short, Elizabeth Mitchell, Judge Reinhold, Wendy Crewson, Lillian Mummy, Alan Arkin, along with Anne Margaret, Spencer Breslin, Eric Lloyd, Isha Tyler, Peter Boyle, Michael Dorn, Jay Thomas, Karen Pollock, Art LaFleur, and Abigail Breslin. It's written by two writers of the second movie, Ed Deckard and John J. Shrouts, and it's directed by, who did the second one also, Michael Lembeck. The movie begins that 12 years later, which has passed since Scott Calvin has now been portrayed as Santa Claus, played by Tim Allen, and he married the principal, Carol Newman, played by Elizabeth Mitchell, and she has now have became a teacher in the North Pole. On Christmas Eve, she tells a group of young elves, including Trish, played by Abigail Breslin, a story of her life with Scott while expecting their first child to be born. Yeah, she was pregnant, and it kind of leads to a lot of false alarms, you know, with him and, and the elves uh, joining by. Um, therefore, Scott invites his in-laws, Carol's parents, uh, Sylvia and Bud Newman, both played by Anne Margaret and Alan Arkin, to the North Pole, Joining by Scott's ex-wife, Laura, played by Wendy Crewson. Her second husband, Neil, played by Judge Reinhold. Her daughter, Lucy, played by Lillian Mumpy. And, of course, Scott's son, Charlie, 
played by Eric Lloyd. Meanwhile, he's being joined to a meeting at the Council of Legendary Figures, and joining with Mother Nature, Father Time, the Easter Bunny, Cupid, the Tooth Fairy, and the Sandman, all played by Isha Tyler, Peter Boyle, Jay Thomas, Karen Pollock, Art Lafleu, and Michael Dorn. They were concerning about the behavior of an evil, conniving, and very schemish, and a schemish Jack Frost, played by Martin Short, who is completely jealous that he has no holiday or special occasion in his honor. And because he's being promoted himself during the Christmas season, Mother Nature suggests all the sanitations against him. Scott, on the other hand, is dealing with how to get the in-laws to come without revealing that he is Santa. So he suggested to actually have Jack Frost to negotiate the light sentence of community service at the North Pole, you know, trying to help out with him and, and the elves by putting up all the decorations of Canadian themed penimanalia, yeah, trying to make it look more Canada. <laughs> it's funny though because the first two films were shot in Canada. <laughs> so just to believe that Karen's parents wants to find out that Scott is actually a toy maker in Canada as he consents. So yes, uh, both uh, Scott and the Sandman have went straight to their house. Um, Sandman accidentally puts in the sleeping powder that caused him to fall asleep and so is him. So they have to rush by to bring them along into the North Pole just to discover the place. But Jack Frost's um, conniving schemes uh, definitely uh, puts for the ultimate goal to trick Santa into renouncing his position. Curtis, the head elf, yeah, taken over for Bernard, played by Spencer Breslin, in embarrassingly reveals the escape clause, which now he spills the beans, and then Frost eventually just sneaks into Santa's hall of snow globes and steals one of containing Scott as Santa. Yeah, after he found out the secret behind all that, when Scott uh, took her took uh, Lucy around to discover it, uh, inside through a, uh, a a spoof of the Red Bull energy drink, yeah, Red Deer uh, bending machine that they had to open, so it can it can go straight into it. And I know when and therefore. He starts to wreak havoc throughout the entire um, Santa's uh, workshop where he, he freezes the machines, he destroys the Naughty or Nice machines, as well as the oven and, and all the espresso machines you know, that makes all these cocos or other coffees, you know, trying to be you know, suave and, and trying to be nice even though he was indeed being over the top and all and trying to you know flirt around with uh, with Sylvia you know and, 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 and all and you know butter himself up here this is where it led to bigger problems because now everything was getting destroyed all the toys all these other machines around with, San with Scott coming around to help you know it's he suddenly tends to Make uh, the entire uh, parts of a of a scooter together. Yeah, I mean, with all of that work that he did, who needs the elves? But he's trying to do his best not to uh, fail himself as as a toy maker. And now he's just it's just getting worse because um, you know he's he's keeps dealing with all these interruptions from everyone, mostly from Curtis. That's, and even worse, Frost um, eventually went inside the snow globe. He steals it. Uh, Lucy uh, was shocked to find out uh, what he did. And now, just to bring in uh, Laura and, and Neil along, this is where Frost uh, incredibly freezes uh, both her parents and leaving Lucy to lock in. So now they're trapped. And to make 
and even worse, um, just the scheme around, he actually takes the parts from the Christmas tree just when Scott was ready to put uh, the, the Christmas uh, star on top of the Christmas tree, having to deal with all these interruptions and all. Suddenly, the, the tree fell and it broke the, the star. And she was feeling very disappointed and sad. I mean, for Carol, and and already he has to deal with all the bickering with um, Bud and Sylvia and all that. They weren't getting; they were having a complete fight. And at that point on, Scott just couldn't take it anymore. And it seems to me like now we're going for the "It's a Wonderful Life" uh, complex. You know, kind of like George Bailey. You know, when he didn't want to be born at all after all the the trouble that causes through um, Mr. Potter. You know, we, we already know how much the biggest miser he could be. I mean, he's the one that stole the the money that caused him to get shocked that he's going to be shut down, you know, accidentally from his uh, partner. Okay. So at that point on, he actually had to say that while he brought in, well, Frost brought in the snow globe. And this is where it goes, travel back in time to 1994, sort of like Back to the Future in a way. Yeah, and I can definitely see that now where we see archive footages of the the first movie where we begin to see Scott Calvin who just spotted Santa Claus on top of the roof who fell off and landed on the ground. You know, he passed away and he was ready to wear the suit. Joining in with Charlie, you know, going up on the ladder, and that's where we spot the Santa sleigh and all. Yeah, we know how the story goes. So at that rate, uh, both Scott and Frost um, was ready to fight together and, you know, trying to, to stop him from taking the, the Santa suit away, and then eventually he did. He, Jack Frost wrote, uh, started wearing the Santa suit, and he took over, he disappeared. And now, Scott had disappeared into the current time, where now he's he's at his office. Uh, he's joined by his um, assistant, who's all alone. I mean, everyone was gone because they're going around for the Christmas Eve party, so he's supposed to be leaving. So now, um, Scott had went back to uh, to Laura, which now she's starting to act completely uh, shallow and nasty, thinking that Scott hasn't been showing up most of the time and never had time for anybody. Yeah, so now we're beginning to see some some sh fights going around. I mean, even Neil is not getting along with Scott either, and Charlie is just being, you know, selfish and nasty. So now he's just going out to hang out with his friends uh, for the Christmas party. And he was very shocked to find out that now Jack Frost had took over a um, a, a theme park and a and a petting zoo uh, resort. Which at this rate, we begin to find out that both Neil and Lucy had just went out to celebrate, and you could definitely tell how nasty they really are. Yeah, I mean, Scott just found... So anyway, uh, yes, um, Charlie... Neil even states that Charlie didn't want to be his father anymore. And it causes the divorce between him and Laura. And Scott confronts Frost that tricks him into recording his voice, uh, stating the escape clause. So at that point on, Scott uh, has Lucy steals the Frost snow globe and brings it to him. When Frost finds out and takes the globe back... Uh, yes, because this is where Frost was doing his performance, joining in with the elves. You know, it's like he's doing his uh, his Christmas song. Um, already, uh, <laughs> Scott was ready to, to stop him with the cops uh, coming around, uh, ready to, uh, to kick him out. Um, Scott plays a recording of Frost saying, I wish I've never been Santa at all said directly through the words of in contents uh, from Jack Frost that's how he told him 
and he bolts the escape clause and causes Scott and Froze to send back again in 1994 where this time you know, Scott finally gets a second chance to steal the the Santa suit so now he gets to wear it and now Frost, dis now Frost disappears along with him going back to the current time in the North Pole exactly how it happened and this is where he stops him and now he, he rushes by to actually explain about what's going on and he felt bad about everything of what he caused and you know he's trying to learn his lesson for what's going on you know telling them the truth confessing so now things are going completely back to normal as as planned so they're gonna fix everything that needs to be solved the elves uh, actually arrested Jack Frost from the police but then they, f Lucy finally came along with um, Laura and Neil already frozen. Um, Scott advised to have Mother Nature to use her power to actually unfreeze them, but she couldn't. So the only thing that could actually save that was to actually have uh, Lucy hugs uh, Frost. So now he becomes, so he becomes uh, completely warm with heart. His power is finally. Uh, um, it's finally uh, melting and now he's becoming good again it, so this power alone can make him change and he's quite different he's not exactly who he is anymore so therefore they fix everything everything went to everything was solved until um, Carol's pregnancy was ready to arrive just in time. So now they just have their newborn child named Buddy Claus. And this is how the story ends as they told the young elves and Trish once Scott finally arrives and just brought in the child. And there you go. That's how the movie ends. But it sure didn't end the series in a high note. This was a piss poor sequel. To the first two I mean you could really tell that um, it was getting completely tiresome with all the boredom that it was going through I mean the slapstick and the platfalls that it went into were incredibly lame excruciatingly one too and it got a bit mean-spirited at time well maybe not too mean-spirited but just a bit mean-spirited and shallow and distasteful I mean it leaves a bad sour taste in my mouth that sort of thing um, on the other hand though it did have its nice moments but that never but that couldn't be saved for this entire script I mean I guess they really were missing all the other writers to join in maybe they could have brought in the, the two writers uh, for the first movie, maybe this could have saved it. Maybe the running time could have been a lot more than just 91 minutes. Maybe it could have been a little bit longer. And in fact, it's also of incredibly insulting the first movie. I mean, it really insulted it really bad, too. And now we begin to see how shallow and nasty uh, Laura and Neil, even Charlie, I mean, the way they're acting. And I mean, into um, the universe, the alternate universe of 1994. I mean, compared to uh, going straight forward to the the current times. I mean, for 2006, that's where we begin to see how bad it is. And that alone, I just didn't like. And but. Therefore, though, I would say, despite it being over the top, I can live with that. Martin Shore was actually, in my opinion, a terrific villain. Actually, a lot better than, than Tim Allen's portrayal of Toy Santa. I mean, that was a pretty lame villain, as I mentioned. In fact, why couldn't it just be Jack Frost instead? He should have been the one to take over before he ends up turning evil uh, with all the schemes and and being so connivingly, you know, suave and all, and the way he acts, you know, trying to give it a, 
a chill that he events. Like he just wants to have all the attention he needs. I mean, with he's filled with raging with jealousy because he doesn't even get to have time to do to have more of of the attention he needs. I mean, that's the problem. Like he could have been pretty much the next Santa at this point. That's exactly what he wanted it to be. So, in, in my opinion, that's probably what they should have had. Because then we would have never had a third film at all. <laughs> It probably would have already uh, taken a, its toll already because the whole point of the second movie was that yes, he, we wanted to search for the Mrs. Claus. Okay, uh, having uh, Anne Margaret and Alan Arkin was a big surprise for me. I mean, they were great together. They had chemistry. Uh, there is a moment too was that. Um, well, I know, even though they were sort of bickering at times here and there. But I, I'm going to get to uh, Sylvia, you know, Anne Margaret. There was a scene in the movie where uh, Jack Frost uh, suddenly uh, tells uh, Sylvia while giving her some some Cocoa Espresso. He was asking him to sing the song because um, you know how legendary uh, Anne Margaret is. Yes, yeah, he wanted him to sing the song... Um, while flirting with him, uh, while flirting with her, chestnuts will sit on an open fire, and this is where she wanted to mention the lyric uh, Jack Frost that will actually melt or or frozen his heart. <laughs> and and the fact that she was singing at that age, I mean, this was perfect. Um, and then there's moments here and there with. Um, the rest of the cast. The only problem was though, as opposed to all the other problems in the film, was Spencer Breslin playing the Curtis the Elf. Um, definitely not the right choice. He was equally and excruciatingly annoying compared to his performance in the second movie. And it was a big mistake having to take over Bernard's place. Now I can see why Crumholtz didn't return, but I know he was busy. But if he actually had returned, I think he would have saved the movie. Because he was terrible in this movie. He really was, and it shows. But he's not a bad actor, again. Um, and the rest of the problems that it really causes, I mean, it wasn't fun having to watch how nasty and shallow uh, Laura along with Neil and even Charlie acting. I mean, Laura acted like a bitch. Neil was acting like an, a complete uh, asshole. I'm sorry I had to say that, but it's true. And Charlie started to act like a complete jerk. Like, they don't seem to care. You know, they're not even getting along with Scott e either because they're, f they're thinking that Scott isn't spending much time with Charlie at all. And that's how it leads to that. And, and maybe even worse, not even hanging out with Lucy, the daughter. So this was pretty bad, how this happens. <sighs> yeah. The special effects in the movie, well, like the second film, it's as pasty, fluffy, kiddish, the way it was done. I mean, it looks magical, but that's exactly what we expected. So it doesn't look too bad. It still blends in with the practical effects of with all the set designs and all of, of the place. Uh, we still have the the composer uh, George S. Clinton to provided the music, you know, trying to give it the the more festive, the more festive, uh, you know, Christmas feel right there. The soundtrack is quite better than than what the second film has. I mean, this time they got A. J. and Ali uh, Makahulka. Nikolka, who, who I know Ali went on to do the TV show Hellcats, as well as appearing in films like Easy A and even <laughs> um, Band Slam and others. Um, the, yeah, they had a Christmas song. Um, there's a music video that's included on the Blu-ray. And there's some other uh, nice songs uh, that's in the soundtrack. So that's really cool. 
So I guess even for that alone, I mean, that kind of almost saves the movie. Uh, the movie, however, is on a small budget, $12 million, but only made uh, $110.8 million, uh, which at this point on, <laughs> the movie Borat, which is now being owned by Disney, <laughs> well, as of today, actually beats uh, the Santa Claus Free, the Escape Clause, for number one at the box office that year. Seeing that the first two films were big hits, I mean, this one, however, just got beaten by. So it really marks a low point in the franchise. Yeah. Now I'm going to say this, though. You'd be better off just watching the first two films over the third film. But if you like the third film, too, that's fine. I mean, I'm, I can live with this. But out of all the worst films that Tim Allen and Spencer Brison had appeared in, I would say... Zoom is the worst of them all, and I would rather watch the Santa Claus Free over that, as opposed to the Shaggy Dog, so there you go. And the fact that this movie was shot in Downey Studios in Downey, California, well, it didn't have the Canadian feels they were hoping for, so they had to do some changes. So anyway, that's the Santa Claus Free, the Escape Clause, and I give the movie one and a half star. I, I hate to sound harsh, but, you know, even with its nice moments and other stuff included, just couldn't help it from this particularly poor script, yet alone the way this, with the lame slapstick and all this other stuff that were put into it that just makes the movie pretty forgettable. So anyway, I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later, much later. Bye.